So today's event, I believe, is a timely one because climate-related or sustainability-related policies touch on a number of economic, environmental, and industry issues, uh, amongst others. Of course, the pollutant uh, emissions and the environment, um, the, the effect on specific industries and sectors. But they also have economic and revenue implications, which are, of course, very important and touch upon directly of what uh, is generally known as corporate stewardship. Now, climate policies are not only about the protection of the environment, as it uh, was used to believe, used to believed. Um, what the governments uh, use regulations, caps, uh, trade systems, or carbon taxes, these are all interventions. And what really changes is the instrument. Now, in addition to all this, uh, companies face climate awareness of their competitors and must also respond to their uh, consumers' growing uh, expectations. I would like to start off the, uh, the, the thinking or, uh, or continue with the introduction with two facts that I have uh, come across uh, recently. One is that companies' behaviors, business behavior, and the protection of the environment, as I've uh, briefly referred to, is, are not so distant concepts as they used to be 10 years ago. Um, a, a recent uh, op-ed in the New York Times from February uh, explained that many companies introduced to set targets reducing their uh, GIG emissions, um, but most of these targets are either weak or inconsistent with the company's policies. So companies trumpet their environmental activism, but what does this really mean? The research that we're going to discuss today tried to find the answers in part also to this. Another fact that I would like to throw in is that what companies do and what they say they would do are not exactly the same. Now, this is a general problem, of course, of public policy and behavior and, and intention-based uh, research, but, but it comes very handy when we are going to talk about the current research. Uh, the international, uh, just to give you a little bit of factual background to this, the international science-based targets initiative, which most of you probably no. A regulator finds that companies' commitments and their actual behavior are rather distant. Also, the commitments are not very comprehensive. A very recent climate awareness report of 2021, which looked at over a thousand consumers' attitudes towards climate change, and the, on the other hand, found that indeed certain labels do inform consumers about uh, uh, carbon uh, um, neutrality and the effects of uh, what they consume, although to a different extent, depending on the age range of the consumers. Now, with our current discussion, our main objective is obviously is to contribute to the ongoing negotiations between the EU institutions and help the thinking supply the results of recent primary research, which we do believe that are very important when it comes to public policy making. Benza has talked about uh, already uh, the, the, the study that we're going to introduce. So I would directly uh, add just one thing is that the study also reflects upon the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of, uh, of the pandemic on companies' behavior vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate policies. The agenda today, we have to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, so we have a panel of four, and I will introduce the panelists in due course whenever they speak, so I wouldn't take much time of that. Right now, um, the, 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 the meeting is registered. So we are on the Zoom platform, as you know, it's registered. All the, uh, the, the presentations are going to be available, going to be made available on Sazer's website, um, so, that's, uh, so that you're aware. Uh, if you have questions, I do ask everyone kindly to, uh, to write them down in the chat box. We will collect them and we will um, uh, read them out after the presentations have taken place. Now, directly to the presentation. Thanks a lot for bearing with me. It was a little bit uh, of uh, housekeeping again, as I said, and I had to say first i would like to ask laszlo cooking who's the research author um, of the of the study uh, Laszlo is a researcher at the sazadwe group and author of the subject of the current webinar he's a lecturer also at the corvinus university of budapest and he's 
academic activity includes 50 plus publications. So we have a, an excellent um, studious person who has come up with uh, the, the results and who has uh, executed the study. So please, Laszlo, um, introduce the study. Be mindful of the fact that I will somehow digitally wave if uh, we're getting close to the uh, time that is attributed to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, everybody. Um, and thank you for your kind uh, introduction, Paul. Uh, my name is Laszlo Kökény, uh, and I am a researcher's climate and energy advisory at Sazodvik Group. Um, and in addition, as uh, Paul mentioned, that I am a PhD candidate at the Cornell University of Budapest. But um, it is a great honor to present uh, our research, uh, which based on the results of a large sample corporate survey, as uh, he mentioned before, uh, describe companies' uh, climate attitudes, perceptions of past and planned investments, and the drivers of decarbonization. Uh, in this presentation, I will and I would like to uh, present the results of our research carried out last year in 2020. Um, here you can see uh, the content elements of the presentation. Uh, I will start with a brief introduction and then turn to our key findings from different aspects. Uh, this is the main uh, part of uh, my presentation. And finally, I will conclude with a summary of this approximately 15 minutes presentation. Uh, yes, and uh, we can start with the aims and the goals of the research. Um, the research focuses on companies' awareness and assessment of the climate goals. Uh, it provides great input to several fields of industry policy, both on the EU, European Union, and on the national level. Uh, within the survey, Sazadvi Group assessed the general attitudes and plans of Hungarian companies regarding climate awareness, carbon neutrality, and energy efficiency uh, related to the new directives. Um, some words about the research background, uh, because we uh, carried out this research in 2020, as I mentioned before. In uh, 2019, 2019 in the leadership of the European Union adopted uh, a new regulatory package, uh, which called Clean Energy for All Europeans, which focused on the decarbonization of the energy sector especially. Uh, companies will have a key role to play in achieving the communities ambitious emission reduction targets. Uh, so it is in the policy interest of member states to learn about the climate protection aspirations of uh, companies. Uh, Hungary will reduce, uh, reduce its uh, greenhouse gas emission by at least 40% compared to the 1990s by 2030. Uh, this is the last year goals. Uh, based on the target set in the, its national energy and climate plan, uh, in 2020, the parliament passed a law that Hungary must become carbon neutral by 2050, uh, increasing companies' energy efficiency and the decarbonization of production processes are essential elements also for achieving these ambitious targets. Um, in order to enact the most effective policy measures possible, government needs to understand the knowledge and the att attitudes of companies towards national climate policy efforts as deeply as possible. Um, yes, and after we can, I can say some uh, words about the methodology and the sample of the research. Um, for the research, we conducted a telephone questionnaire survey in June uh, 2020, last summer. Uh, the data collection took place in two separate target groups. On the one hand, we contacted all large emitter companies covered by the ETS emission trading system, uh, of which 42 respondents were included in the final sample. On the other hand, we interviewed 1,007 uh, non-ETS, or we can call them low emission companies. The sample of small emitters, these uh, 1,007 companies, uh, was representative of Hungary in terms of industry and number of employees. And I can continue with our main or selected findings because we have a lot of results in this research also, but we uh, selected some of them. Uh, 
yes, uh, here you can see uh, about the, uh, the attitudes about the regulation. And uh, we can see that the companies had a positive attitude towards these state directives listed above or mentioned before uh, by me. And almost uh, more than 66% were indeed aware of them. This was even higher for companies with higher sales, more employees and more energy use, nearly above uh, 70%. Uh, in addition, these companies have already dealt with a greater proportion of issues related to climate protection objectives, uh, for example, carbon neutrality, energy efficiency, renewable or renewable energy sources, um, and the planning of their investments, developments and procurement than smaller players was higher. Uh, companies with higher sales and more employees considered the listed state guidelines as strict but effective. Uh, more than 45% of the Hungarian companies regularly follow international news and regulatory reports on the topic in an international way. Uh, the degree of ambition was examined in different ways, uh, as you see here uh, below the slide. Uh, on average, almost 60% of the respondents uh, consider the solution in the transformation of production processes is the most important or the entire op operation, for example, infrastructure based investments, integration of renewable energy sources, uh, and so on. So it was believed that meeting the carbon neutrality goals and guidelines go beyond the company's internal operations. But if the transformation was to begin, they will likewise begin changing their own inner processes. It is very important. Uh, in the field of uh, completed and planned uh, climate protection developments, large emitter companies and ETS companies have been more active in recent years, and they likewise plan to make environmental investments in the future. See, uh, in the figure, uh, you can see the higher ratio for the ETS companies, and uh, this ratio is higher in the non-ETS companies for the large emitters and non-ETS uh, companies. Um, developments have been carried out and are planned mainly by those who employ more people, have higher sales, use more energy, and are mostly active, especially in the electricity sector. Uh, in addition, actors from the construction and agricultural sectors were also active in developments. Um, it is important to mention that uh, we uh, see a lot of industry and a lot of uh, sector and the representative, uh, the sample was representative in Hungary by this way also. Uh, yes, and uh, other figure, we can see that um, the company's point of view, uh, they consider the use of renewable energy sources to be the most important tool for achieving climate protection goals. Uh, it is also important to improve energy efficiency, especially in the field of ETS companies, the large emitters. Uh, here we can see uh, that the order and the proportions are reversed uh, between the renewable energy sources and the energy efficiency. So uh, between the non-ETS companies, the reno renewable energy sources uh, development is in the first place. But uh, in case of ETS companies, um, the energy efficiency is the most important tool to achieve uh, the climate goals. Um, and other uh, investments, for example, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure and technology investments are expected, especially for companies in the industrial sectors. So we can uh, see a smaller proportion, but uh, we can talk about it also. Um, we also measure the pressure uh, from the uh, stakeholders. And uh, before that, we see that the, the main tools and the specific fields of the future development. The company surveyed plan to install renewable energy sources mainly, but especially PV and solar panels, we see uh, in the questionnaire results. This is mostly planned for the short term within five to 10 years. Uh, as the company sales and energy use increased, the proportion of companies did not have renewable energy capacities gradually decreased significantly. Uh, 
large emitters see the use of biomass as one of the most effective renewable energy tools. In more than 70% of the respondents, the modernization of heating systems is the primary element, um, but the building modernization followed by the replacement, replacement of machines, doors, windows, and so on, are also uh, important in secondary or, uh, or later uh, case. Two of the thirds uh, of the companies say that the most necessary element for the development of production is the modernization of production in equipment. This is especially true for large industrial players, especially for large energy intensive companies. Uh, further, further developments focused mainly on lightning improvements and machine replacements. 20% of the companies surveyed had electric cars and with nearly 30% planning to replace their fleet with electric vehicles over the next 15 years. Uh, so we can see some uh, um, focused uh, tools uh, in the other technology development. And after, as I mentioned before, we measure the pressure from the uh, stakeholders. And we see that the company's customers do not yet put enough pressure on them to change their activities. But uh, in the future, uh, companies expect them to increase their expectations and put pressure uh, on companies encouraging uh, to pursuit of corporate carbon neutrality. From a motivational point of view, uh, one of the strong, uh, strongest incentives to achieve climate protection goals is if customers have green expectation, see figure below. Uh, in addition, the actors responsible for regulation, for example, as you see here in the figure, government, authority, other regulators, can have a defining effect on the achievement of climate protection goals also. Uh, what we also see uh, is the smaller companies fear actors in their immediate environment, especially customers uh, and a little bit competitors. Uh, but the larger companies, however, focus more on impulses coming from national bodies. Here we can see higher proportion or higher ratio from the regulators, authorities, energy suppliers and the government. And uh, before the summary, uh, we uh, finally measured uh, the main uh, support and incentive uh, fields. Um, primary support is expected from state and European Union subsidies, specific programs and calls, standards, financing their energy efficiency development, financing the company's uh, energy efficiency developments. Um, among the activities to be encouraged, the respondents expect support from, for the exchange of assets, as we uh, see before um, in the figures. And the renovation of real estate is a very important uh, field uh, for the incentives or the program. Um, and the respondents also mentioned that and expect uh, the introduction of tax benefits. Uh, it is also considered useful to keep energy prices low or provide some donation when switching, switching to the renewable energy sources. Uh, they mentioned also uh, that. Uh, funded programs have also emerged as possible motivating elements, which can be aimed at further training or exchange of tools. So not only uh, financing programs, we can see some education advanced studies, uh, expectation, but uh, we see also that uh, it is also require uh, uh, it is also requiring some uh, donation too. And finally, uh, here you can see our summary uh, in the end of my presentation. Uh, so we can uh, say that uh, it can be concluded that the companies are mostly familiar with carbon neutrality aspiration and goals with the expect exception of the smallest companies, the smallest one, uh, low uh, with low employees a number. And, uh, but the other, the nearly 80% uh, of them uh, agree with the national and the European Union 
uh, goals. Uh, companies also support uh, and agree with government regulatory efforts, but consider it important to have the right incentives put in place. Uh, these motivating elements are considered important mainly because it is believed that development promoting climate protection will lead to uh, significant cost increases, so they are afraid of uh, uh, cost increases. Uh, from the results, it seems that the wide range and extent of incentives also determine the ambition of economic actors in the issue. Um, most industries consider the Hungarian program uh, supporting the replacement of old energy wasting devices to be effective. It is a previous uh, program in the recent years. Uh, and the respondents also uh, very um, positive about the support for the renovation of non-energy efficient properties, uh, which more than 80% consider a well-executed program in Hungary uh, in also uh, in the past, uh, or in the near past. And the companies see the solution in the development of renewable energy sources and energy efficiency investments in terms of achieving climate neutrality goals, uh, the most important uh, tools. Typically, large emitter companies, companies in the electricity and in construction industries, and larger small emitters are more open to the issue of climate neutrality. They have already started climate protection developments in the recent years, so we can say that the work already began. And this kind of willingness to invest can increase further if the green pressure from the customers strengthens, especially from the end users. And until then, however, it is very important to talk about economic and social sustainability also, in addition to natural sustainability, which can be guaranteed by incentives, especially, and the low electricity prices and well-executed programs in Hungary, as we see in the near past. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention. and. Uh, uh, it is a great opportunity and a pleasure to me also, and uh, I am looking forward to your uh, kind and, uh, questions too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laszlo. Um, thank you also for uh, um, keeping the, the, the time uh, allotted to you. So, um, yes, interesting results. Uh, I, I would also be very interested uh, later on perhaps to to hear one of the, the largest Hungarian companies uh, view uh, on this. And, uh, and I've noted to myself that customers in, uh, in the CE or perhaps uh, let's just take Hungary, although I don't believe that the results would be very different in other Central European countries, um, are not yet considered by the companies as an important uh, competitive pressure in order to opt their, their understanding of, of climate uh, issues. I, I'm pretty sure that it's uh, very different uh, uh, towards the Western part of uh, the European Union, which of course gives a uh, task not so easy to the European Commission when it comes to climate policies. And in order to start a nice pattern and also gender wise, um, uh, I believe that now um, Anna would be the best person to, to start reflecting upon what we've heard. So Anna, is uh, a policy officer at the European Commission's Director General for Climate Action, Governance, and, um, and at the uh, Effort Sharing Unit. While already at the Commission, she has worked on fiscal governance, macrofinancial stabilization, taxation policy, and economic policy coordination. Before joining the Commission in tw um, 2009, Anna was a staff member at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. She holds a PhD uh, in economics from the University of Bonn. Obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have Anna, uh, have someone from the European Commission who, who has uh, thought that this is a webinar worth attending also at uh, um, you know, being part of a panel. And uh, thereby, uh, Anna will start the, uh, the, the, the excellent panel uh, we have uh, uh, two other uh, great uh, persons joining that panel later on. So, um, Anna, please, uh, from your point of view, we'd like to be, uh, you know, 
hearing uh, from from uh, from you and also perhaps a little bit from the European Commission um, in the light of in the shadows of the Fit for 55, which, which has been published this summer. So Anna, the floor is yours. Unmute yourself, please. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Hopefully I have done that. So thank you for this kind introduction. And also thanks to Laszlo for having us ha having taken us through the findings of uh, this interesting study on Compari's, Compari's attitudes towards climate issues in Hungary. Now we have heard that the regulatory framework plays quite a bit of a role here. here and uh, as you were highlighting, I think uh, it's indeed this regulatory framework is in the midst of change. Having said that, I should immediately kind of uh, put a caveat in the sense that it's going to change in the level of ambition, but very much we are in terms of instruments having a great deal of stability. Uh, stability building on a tried and tested framework that has already helped us a lot in Europe to deliver uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, now, um, you have mentioned also the keyword of, excuse me, I'm still on the title slide. Uh, you have mentioned the keyword of Fit for 55. Uh, the Commission chose actually uh, in official communications to uh, speak about delivering the European Green Deal, where well, the European Green Deal is much vaster than basically this climate part, but Fit for 55 was uh, often understood as uh, having connotations of uh, preparing people for pre-retirement. Actually, what I like to say is indeed we are working on preparing for pre-retirement, but this is not on people, it's in greenhouse gas emissions. So the pre-retirement on greenhouse gas emissions scheduled actually for 2030. I would like to give you on this slide a bit of context of uh, the locating the 55% climate objective, uh, climate policy target for 2030. To be clear, this rests in the context of the broader horizon of the long-term objective of uh, climate neutrality in 2050 uh, that the uh, European Union has set to itself, uh, which means a net zero target. There will be, of course, some emissions, but on balance, there should be uh, net zero greenhouse gas emission situation in 2050. And to reach it, uh, we had so far in, for 2030, we had the climate target at the EU level of 40% of emission reductions relative to 1990. Uh, if we rest with the 40% 40, uh, 40 for 2030, this will give us a rather steep and ambitious trajectory for 2030 to 50. And it will also cost much more because if we continue to invest into, uh, into uh, fossil fuel technologies and so on, so it's better to start the journey now. And to do so, uh, the commission has on 14 July proposed a vast legislative package, basically which uh, um, very much rests on existing legislation and proposes amendments of existing legislation. There is also some new pieces which are meant to uh, make the European economies and European societies fit for achieving 55% reductions in 2030. So let us now go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, delivering the Green Deal. Uh, you see here the basically three pillars of the approach. The package is providing a balanced approach combining different climate policy instruments that have been tried and tested in the Union. So we are resting with the we are resting with the existing instruments, which consist of pricing, carbon pricing. We have the the uh, European Emissions Trading System, which contains uh, targets, uh, uh, climate policy tar targets at large, like the 55%, but also specific sectoral targets. And we are having a set of rules also to underpin this framework. Now the Commission's package also includes some specific support measures. I will give a bit of uh, context also on this. Um, now let me go a little bit into detail at this point. Excuse me, I, yes, okay, let's go here. Uh, excuse me, I'm following that on my own side. Um, here you see basically the three basic pillars of the existing uh, climate and energy policy architecture of the Union. Uh, the most important of it, the so-called uh, crown jewel, is the emissions trading system. Um, at present, uh, so this system is basically a cap and trade system for uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, CO2 emission allowances uh, that are being traded on markets and or on one market. And at present, this cap would deliver us for uh, 2030 uh, reductions of 43% in these sectors. These sectors are basically the energy sector. As we have heard, we have heard about ETS installations. These are the large companies, uh, large industry uh, emitters. Um, 
aviation has been included so far as well, but uh, they have been receiving free allowances. The proposal uh, um, proposes now to, so the amendments propose now to uh, have that uh, phased out. And now it's also proposed to put maritime transport in a certain scheme under the emissions trading system. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, to get to 55% altogether in 2030, it is proposed to, it is proposed to um, um, raise, so basically, tighten the cap of the ETS uh, to reach 61% uh, of emissions reductions relative to 2005 in 2030. So this is the one pillar. Now we have the second pillar. Basically, uh, the ETS emissions make up something like 40% of EU emissions now. The rest of the 60% are coming under the effort sharing sectors. Effort sharing sectors, there is no market for allowances uh, for these sectors. Basically, in these sectors, it's the public sphere to act. It's uh, member states to act, and they are responsible for bringing down emissions in the affected sectors, which are so far road and trans road transport and buildings, architecture, waste, uh, architecture, excuse me, <laughs> agriculture, buildings, architecture, uh, agriculture, waste, small industry, F gases, and uh, and uh, energy non-CO2 emissions. Uh, so in these sectors, the member states, we have the EU uh, overall target of 40%, and there is a specific mechanism to break that down in binding national targets. Uh, Hungary at present uh, is having for 2030, the emissions reduction target again relative to 20, 2005 of 7% reductions. This is not tremendously much. Uh, Hungary is likely to overachieve it anyway, uh, but uh, new member states, lower income member states tend to have lower targets. Obviously these targets are one of the key principles of setting these targets is fairness, meaning that those countries have to do more who have a higher capacity to act. And uh, the proposal envisages for Hungary the new target of 18.7%, uh, which is an increase of just about 11%, which is also the EU average. So this is for the effort sharing sectors. Uh, and there is a new element which would mean uh, to put also to introduce uh, emissions trading for road transport and buildings while leaving these uh, two sectors under the effort sharing. Um, why is that? Uh, this is. Uh, to kind of basically um, capitalize on the on the uh, market on the price signal of carbon pricing on the one hand, and on the other hand, on the other hand, still kind of provide member states to have a role in this uh, in this uh, task to decarbonize these sectors that have been so far not. Uh, producing uh, tremendously uh, uh, steep decreases of uh, 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 CO2 emissions. Just on the contrary, as we will see in, for example, road transport emissions are on the rise still in Hungary, for example, among others. So uh, finally, the third very important pillar of the climate architecture is the so-called LULUCF sector, uh, land use, land use change, and forestry. This sector um, is uh, the interesting part of it is it, that is basically a net uh, removal uh, here in the sector, net removals of carbon happen. Uh, so there are some emissions, but there are also the very important natural carbon sinks so that the natural environment absorbs carbon basically. And this is going to be very important for our net uh, zero uh, target for 2050, uh, where there will be obviously some emissions, but the LULUCF sector needs to be strengthened to be able to, um, to play the role of uh, carbon absorption capacity. And to get there, uh, it is proposed that, uh, so from getting, getting away from the present, uh, yeah, I see I need to speed up. We need to strengthen the uh, carbon absorption role of the, of the LULUCF sector, and therefore now a specific removal objective is also set in the proposed legislation. Now let's go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, here you see basically snapshots of uh, a variety of funds. Uh, obviously this transition is quite demanding, uh, obviously it needs to happen <laughs> the sooner the better, but it will uh, cost quite a bit of money of investments. It's at the same time also an opportunity, an opportunity to assume uh, technological leadership, an opportunity to turn our economic model into a sustainable model, sustainable also in the ecological sense and also enhance the welfare of uh, Europeans basically. Uh, the present EU budget combined with the new tool called New Generation EU, you will be aware of this. Uh, all in all, this is uh, pool of about uh, 2 trillion um, euro for 21 to 27. And of this, 30% are earmarked for climate action. There is a certain methodology to measure that. But from this vast amount of EU funding, 21 to 27, a third has to 30% have to go to climate funding anyway. 
uh, within this, there is also the resilience uh, and uh, recovery and resilience facility. You are aware that um, every member state is setting up a plan for recovery and resilience that is approved by the Commission, adopted by the Council, and then uh, member states get a huge amount of money, grants and loans, if they wish, um, to promote these uh, policies for uh, recovery and resilience, and the Hungarian plan uh, is still being developed, therefore I'm not going to go into details there, but this is also a huge amount of money ahead. And on the recovery and resilience funding, actually 37% have to go on climate objectives. Uh, then we have the very important innovation fund uh, that is uh, funding private projects that are uh, demonstration projects for low carbon technologies. Uh, the funding there comes not from the EU budget, from, but from revenues under the emissions trading system. And as the carbon price is going to increase, uh, there uh, also these revenues are going to are expected to significantly increase for the purpose. And also more money has been allocated for the purposes of the fund on the one hand. On the other hand, um, we have the modernization fund. You can see that uh, in the bottom left. Uh, on the modernization fund, this is a specific fund from ETS revenues again, which go to the new member states, uh, to, to the lower income member states, I should better say, um, meant to finance the energy transition in their energy systems. And there are also significant amounts uh, are available for this purpose. And also the modernization fund is proposed for an upgrade uh, with, the, with the package of proposals uh, uh, in the 50 to 55 package. So now I uh, have a final slide, which basically looks at the situation in Hungary, just to give a little bit of national context. Uh, you will see on the lower panel, you see a certain discontinuity, but don't bother with this. An update of these data is forthcoming end of October. But what you can see here, basically different emissions across sectors. Uh, we have seen uh, huge declines in the energy sector, but the yellow graph is the transportation sector, and there you see a continued increase. So this is really something where action is definitely necessary. And on the other side, I've put the existing uh, climate and energy targets that are found in the National Energy and Climate Plan of Hungary. We have heard that mention. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, Lasso mentioned that plan that has been drawn up uh, early last year, of course, under the existing targets. And basically, um, uh, we can note there that uh, when it comes to uh, renewables and energy efficiency, uh, the Commission's analysis has shown that the, uh, Hungary is basically uh, assuming relatively low ambition there. So in both areas, there is scope for more. Um, so this was a very quick go through the situation, the broader scene uh, at the European level and also some uh, snapshot insights on Hungary. I have also noted to myself some specific figures on possible funding to Hungary, but I don't know to what extent I should now go into detail. Perhaps we can, we can spare that for a uh, discussion afterwards. So uh, let me give the floor to the next presenter. Thank you a lot. Thank, thank you, Anna. It was uh, absolutely fitting into the pattern that that we had imagined first we heard about the research results and what companies think and what they want and now we've seen uh, what the commission thinks companies want and what they should be doing and how it provides funding for that now it's just a matter of coordination i think uh, <laughs> uh it's uh, it's now quite timely to see what a very important if not the most important company in Hungary uh, thinks about uh, what you've said. Um, and of course, we are absolutely proud that we, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we keep the gender equality uh, at, uh, at best uh, yeah, European level. So let me welcome the second uh, uh, participant uh, to the panel, uh, Ilona Vari, who's head of EU regulatory affairs at MOL Group, a leading integrated center Eastern European oil and gas corporation headquartered, of course, in Budapest, Hungary. Now, probably I don't need to introduce MOL Group to the audience as one of the largest Hungarian companies, as it has operations over 30 countries and employs 25,000 people worldwide. Uh, needless to say, this is not in the, uh, in the range of SMEs or micro enterprises, rather at the other end. Um, but we would be very interested to hear Ilona's reflection on, on what we've uh, heard so far and, uh, and how more 
imagines the, the situation. So Ilona, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark, for the very nice introduction. And uh, good morning to everyone. So if we can move to the first slide. Uh, so Moore Group uh, is a large company for Hungary, but uh, I have to tell you that uh, our competitors are the big international oil and, and gas companies uh, are much bigger than us. So, uh, but for Hungarian sizes, uh, we are very proud of ourselves and what we achieved. And of course, we want to stay here in Europe, in Central Europe for the future. And we want to live in this new uh, decarbonized world as well. So that's why we accepted the invitation and thank you very much uh, for the uh, organizers uh, for inviting us. Uh, as you can see that we are a big energy company, so climate change decarbonization, uh, it's a very important topic for us. That's why uh, we follow the, those developments uh, for many years now. And uh, we follow global developments, European as well as uh, national developments in our core countries. If we can move to the next slide, please. So we can see that there is a growing public concern uh, which drives uh, the uh, government, EU governments, uh, for pushing towards uh, decarbonization. Uh, Anna explained the, the new uh, challenge for us. So we are also dealing with the Fit for 55 uh, package. And how we do with this and what we think about that. Uh, so we think that uh, no doubt uh, this energy transition, low carbon transition has to be done. Uh, it seems to be possible. Uh, however, we think that these debates on the Fit for 55 will bring out many questions. And uh, I would highlight some. So what is the timing? What are the costs? Uh, who will pay the cost of decarbonization? So these are very important questions, and I think uh, Paul mentioned that it's uh, ex exceptionally important in our region. So what we do as, uh, at MOL, so if we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, we started our journey in 2016 when we realized that there are rapid changes in the energy and the transport sector. And uh, we have to assess different solutions, how to put the company on a sustainable path. Uh, of course, energy efficiency is a very important uh, factor. Uh, and uh, we have always uh, had uh, targets for energy efficiency, but we realized that uh, these measures are not enough. The challenge is much bigger and we need much more drastic changes in our operation and in our products as well. So uh, we decided in 2016 that we have to get prepared for the beyond the fuel age. And uh, we, uh, we decided that, that we will become a chemical and mobility service company. But during the last two years, uh, we noticed that uh, there is even more growing public demand and political will to intensify the decarbonization process. That's why uh, we launched a new strategy uh, just the beginning of this year, which, by the way, we will need to revise uh, because of the 50, uh, Fit for 55 package again. So we went through this uh, revision and uh, we uh, declared a new strategy uh, in, in February, which, which we call Sh uh, Shape Tomorrow Strategy with the goal to set for ourselves uh, carbon uh, targets and uh, reduction targets. What we've done during this process, we assessed different options, uh, technologies, feedstocks, and uh, we assessed uh, these, uh, these elements based uh, on, the, on our knowledge when these solutions and technologies become profitable because of the market demand, or because of uh, regulatory support. And uh, we found that there are, of course, new feedstocks which we can use. There are many new technologies uh, which can reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission of operation and, and products. And also there are big opportunities in electrification. But of course, some of these possibilities are much more costly what, uh, than what we do today. And uh, some of them are in development phase. 
And uh, regarding electrification, uh, we realize that uh, if we have this uh, new uh, shift to decarbonized world, we will need much more electricity. And uh, all this new electricity should come from renewable or low carbon sources. So our conclusion is that uh, energy transition will only take place if there is appropriate uh, regulation and predictable regulation, which is promoting low carbon investment and low carbon solutions. And uh, based on our assessment, we, we found some elements which we can already use uh, based on our knowledge on regulation and also on the market. And uh, we decided that we will reduce our uh, scope one and two, meaning direct and indirect emissions uh, by 30% by 2030. And we will uh, achieve net zero by 2050. Uh, we will increase uh, our investments in uh, in low carbon technologies and those kind of sustainable uh, sustainable investments which are aligned with the European legislation of taxonomy, which, which is collecting all those uh, investments which are sustainable on a long term. And we also introduced uh, some uh, internal administrative measures to incentivize uh, the management to reduce greenhouse gas emission of the company. So this is what we have done. And uh, we, uh, we managed to get the approval of the, the owners of the company, the board. So based on that one, we are working now to deliver this uh, strategy. Uh, and uh, of course, we, we are responsible towards our uh, owners that we will do that and also for our consumers. And uh, if we can, yes, what, what our vision about the future of mall? So we can see that we will have much diverse feedstock in the future. And uh, based on this uh, feedstock, we will be able to, uh, to deliver much better products uh, to our consumers, uh, much more low carbon products to our consumers. Um, so we are ready to deliver, we are ready to invest uh, in a low carbon future. Now, what is the challenge for us? So as I've mentioned, this uh, energy transition uh, is expected to be regulatory driven. Uh, so we hope that the public and political support uh, remains unchanged in the future. Uh, and we will be able to deliver our targets and also the uh, EU will be able to deliver the EU climate law. Uh, the Sazadvik study also pointed out uh, that uh, according to many companies, uh, there is a need for investment, investment, so money, money, money. <laughs> so energy transition has a very high cost. We made some calculation that in the future, every fifth Hungarian foreign uh, state is spending and companies uh, spending should go uh, invest to, to be invested in energy transition during the next 25 years. So it's a huge amount of investment. And in addition, as I mentioned, many products will most probably be most, more costly. So we need a very clever and well-defined regulation in good, with good uh, timing in order to keep the consumers attracted uh, by the climate uh, change uh, mitigation process. Uh, but we risk, we risk uh, that companies become uh, less competitive and we also risk uh, that we lose the support of the public because it will be very painful for the public as well. Just some numbers again, again uh, in the Commission's uh, impact assessment, we found that uh, the household's energy cost will be 28% higher in 2030 than it is now. And we also assess the Fit for 55 uh, package, uh, which might drive to about 50% uh, increase in fossil fuel prices. Of course, we can say that, okay, we have to switch to low carbon solutions, but for some years, diesel fuel and fossil fuels will still remain with us. 
And I think it's very important what is the timing of these changes, how we do, how we address uh, the problem of, uh, of competitiveness of companies and also the energy poor uh, situation. Otherwise, we lose support and that will also make uh, uh, very difficult for companies to comply with the commitments. So to conclude, uh, the energy transition may only be successful if it keeps public support and people believe uh, that it is necessary and they also have to do some, something and change uh, their lives. And it's also very important, as the Commission is very often saying, that no one will be left behind. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to uh, take part in the discussion later on. Thank you. Irena, thank you very much for this very uh, direct and, and uh, informing presentation from a company point of view. I do sense some discomforting or uh, uh, let's say not necessarily supporting ideas between the, the, the previous presentation and what we heard from from Anna now um, but let's uh, get back to those uh, I've made a couple of notes myself to uh, during the questions time. now uh, to conclude the panel obviously this is my uh, my absolute pleasure uh, and beyond professional pleasure it's also my personal pleasure to welcome ambassador kurashi um, to the panel who is a director currently uh, of environmental sustainability at the office of the president of hungary now uh, chaba in his long career as a diplomat um, he served, for example, as the permanent representative of Hungary to the UN, also vice president of the UN General Assembly uh, 10 years ago, and co-chair of the UN Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals. goals. Now, he is, uh, I could say almost obviously, a well-decorated diplomat, his credits having been recognized by a handful of countries and international organizations. Now, beyond his professor credits, I'm also very uh, uh, happy to welcome uh, him also as, as a friend of mine, if he doesn't mind me saying that, um, and, uh, and a person with, with extremely uh, great knowledge of uh, sustainability issues. So Chabo, please uh, enlighten us from your perspective uh, uh, of what we've heard before. Thank you. Thank you much, Polly, for the very generous introduction. And uh, I just would be happily reiterate that I'm so happy to, uh, to be your friend. Uh, the colleagues have invited us to a journey uh, or from here to carbon neutrality. Uh, it was on EU level, on corporate level. And let me try to give you a very simple but a cross-cutting snapshot on how would it work, whether or not, uh, on the national level. Uh, the emission uh, to, uh, to reach car uh, carbon neutrality in this country uh, would mean to bring emission and sinks into equation. And uh, I will use the data of 2019, which is uh, the last data, uh, audited data uh, by the member states, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, total emission, uh, green, greenhouse gas emission in 2019 was 64.4 million tons. Uh, uh, by the way, in per capita emission, it was 6.62, uh, 6.6 ton, uh, compared to the EU average, uh, it was 27% lower than the EU, EU average. Uh, the total emission of this country uh, has been reduced in the last 30 years by 32%, while EU's similar reduction uh, was on the level of 28.3%. So how to reduce them, or how to reach uh, carbon neutrality? The first and most evident uh, uh, opportunity uh, would be emission reduction. Uh, how emission is uh, coming in, in, uh, on the level of, of the country? What are the key factors influencing, influencing the emission? First and foremost, the size of the population. Each and every country or com uh, community 
The second, the GDP per capita, uh, the size of the GDP per capita. The third is energy intensity, what extensively has been mentioned by, uh, by the colleagues. And last but not least, the carbon intensity uh, of mostly the energy sector. If uh, we look into these uh, four factors, we can identify them as multipliers in an equation. It means if we increase or double one of the factors, it will double the final outcome. If we half one of the uh, one of the uh, the factors, it will half the uh, final uh, figure we get. So the population in this country, unfortunately, is shrinking. So by 2050, uh, while we uh, we hope to reach carbon neutrality, uh, the shrinking will be by 10%. Uh, it might be a bad news for the nation, good news for, uh, for, uh, for the climate. But as to the GDP per capita, uh, it is set to go twice. Uh, so now Hungary's GDP per capita on purge, uh, purchasing power terms uh, is standing on at 76% of the European average, and we would like to double it uh, by 2050. So it will be a sharp increase uh, potentially uh, on, on the uh, emission. On energy intensity, uh, there was a reduction in this country on energy intensity by 38% since 1990, a similar reduction, a little bit smaller reduction could be observed on the level of the European Union. By the way, today's energy intensity in Hungary stands on the level of 206 kilogram oil equivalent per 1000 euros. Uh, the carb, uh, car, uh, uh, carbon intensity, the last box, has been reduced in this country since 1990 by 49% compared uh, to the European average of a, a significantly smaller number. And uh, now the uh, Hungarian carbon intensity indicator stands on 226 gram uh, CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Uh, but what other, uh, just a minute. Uh, what other means could be considered uh, to reach carbon neutrality? Theoretically, of course, uh, increasing the capacity of carbon sink or uh, carbon sequestration. And uh, now uh, the uh, carbon sinks in Hungary are standing on 5.8 million ton, uh, ton per year. It should be raised for sure. And uh, uh, Theoretically, there could be another method of uh, carbon leakage, exporting carbon in intensive uh, activities into other parts of the world, but of course it would not help the climate at all. And economically, while uh, much of the, uh, of the uh, emission comes from, from sectors that cannot be exported, you will see uh, shortly, uh, it is. Uh, it doesn't make too much sense. Plus, the emitting industries in this country are quite young, so it's highly unlikely that these industries will be relocated to, to other countries. So, uh, what pure and simple mathematics show us? If uh, we would like to reduce emission in this country. Uh, to the 10% of the level of 1990, it means a 90% reduction. What are the parameters we have to keep in mind? The population is going to shrink. GDP per capita is going to double. So basically, these two are not in our hands too much. The, uh, what we can really deal with, energy intensity and carbon intensity. And in order to get the equation here, uh, you will have these two, uh, two factors combined to give you a one on 18 figure. It means that, for example, if you decrease energy intensity by three, you have to decrease carbon intensity by six. That's quite challenging, uh, but not impossible. Uh, let us now see what does it mean in terms of sectors, different economic sectors in the country. 
the largest emitter, as Anna also indicated in her chart, is tra transport. It, it is still on the rise. Uh, it should be basic. It should basically go carbon free by 2050. It's a huge challenge. Uh, industry is the second largest emitter. Uh, should uh, go to one seventh of the uh, of the uh, uh, present uh, emission level by 2050. The building sector uh, should go to one sixth of the present level. And agriculture uh, should go down to one third of its present uh, emission uh, emission level. Power generation basically should be carbon free. Uh, the uh, waste uh, management uh, that is still a significant emitter uh, in this country uh, uh, should uh, go down to one eighth of the present uh, level. Uh, the central heating, which is still a considerable emitter, should go basically carbon free, as well as we hope to get all the so called other sectors, including uh, pipe leakage, for example, to be absolutely or very close to carbon free by 2050. What would it mean? Uh, in order to get uh, in order to get uh, us to an equation, these reductions would take us to roughly 7 million ton per year. Uh, the sinks should be increased by 30%, what would mean in normal daily terms, 20,000 hectares of forest to be increased annually throughout 30 years. It's again a huge challenge. Five points for the conclusion. Uh, the whole journey is very challenging, but not impossible. 2.2 uh, reduction through 30 years would be required, though we know that it will not be a linear process. The 2030 target of minus 55% 50, 50, uh, would require roughly the same rate of reduction. The EU average on annual reduction rate would be slightly higher, 2.4% and 2.3% respectively. The second observation, the key areas in Hungary, transport, industry, building sector, uh, and power generation, all together, they can provide 70% of the necessary reduction. Number three, systemic challenge will be needed in the transport. It's not enough to improve the efficiency of in, uh, internal combustion engines. We are going to have a revolution in this field if we want to have uh, the carbon neutrality. Number four, profound technology change will be needed in the CO2 industry, uh, intensive industries like steel, cement, glass, or rubber. They are not too big in this country, but still significant emitter. And it is, and last but not least, in the field of agriculture, a technology leapfrogging will be required in raising ruminants and using fertilizers. Uh, the, today's technology is what we have, might take us close to the 2030 targets, but not much beyond. So we have to keep in mind that technology leapfrogging and technology improvement technology revolution is very much needed for this country, I think as well as other European countries, to get a, a carbon neutrality or climate neutrality by 2050. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you very much. Um, quiet uh, eye-opening, if not uh, shocking uh, numbers and, and figures here. A simple math uh, we've learned is never a simple math, uh, although it looks uh, neat on the paper. Uh, the good news is that, uh, that what Chaba has presented us on the last slide, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to all uh, we have an EU action, the farm to fork strategy, the efficiency of building, um, um, 
efficient performing of buildings directive revision the transport now are going under ets uh, we do try to target it with the cbam also so so from a, a regulatory and policy perspective uh, i think we could be there now the question is of course how consumers and companies react to that and uh, i do fully understand what uh, ilona was saying uh, in particular, in the case of a large company, that uh, objectives are nice, policy uh, might be there, but uh, you know what's the point of uh, um, you know sa saving the planet if there will be nobody on it because everybody dies in the process, including the companies. So uh, you know we need to need to balance this uh, somehow, but. Uh, Yes, it was a very, very good uh, uh, presentation, in particular in, uh, in the, from the perspective of, of Hungary. So thank you very much for that. Now, uh, we have concluded our uh, panel at this point. Um, I do have several questions, um, but a little bit, uh, you know, perhaps uh, unorthodoxly, I would like to give the opportunity to the panelists um, perhaps to each of uh, the, the participants uh, to ask a question of the presenter of the study uh, concerning because at the very end we are talking about companies awareness and the assessment of their uh, their attitude and, and behavior towards uh, climate goals so uh, whatever question you may have um, um, I, I encourage you to uh, to ask of the, 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 the presenter. Um, but while you're thinking about that, uh, I, I would like to ask a question um, to Laszlo, right? Uh, so we, we have heard that uh, uh, from, from your uh, results, uh, you've come to the conclusion that companies in Hungary do believe that what the most important for them is, and again, Ilona has underlined this quite clearly, what the most important for them is, is public policy, right public policy as a pressure in order to, uh, to, um, you know, to reach the climate policy objectives. So it's not the consumers. Do you have, uh, Laszlo, any, um, have, you, have you come across any studies uh, that would uh, would put into perspective, into European perspective of this understanding. Is this different in your opinion in Central Europe and uh, perhaps in the Netherlands uh, or in, in Western Europe, in other countries where climate policies, environmental mindfulness or environmental mindedness is, is, have, have, has been present for a longer amount of time? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, also your conclusion and also the question for me. Um, I, I can see a difference between the industry. So I can answer your question uh, shortly. It is a, I think it is a sector based or a sector specific uh, approach. Uh, because um, in an other hat, uh, I am an um, uh, economics in marketing field also, and we can see uh, two different types of companies. Uh, one is that the customer oriented, and the other is the production uh, oriented uh, 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 companies. And uh, the difference between that uh, in the stakeholders and the proportion of the stakeholders and uh, I agree with Ilona that in that way, the, the, the public policy can uh, pressure, can, uh, can uh, uh, give rules or, or, or add or other uh, directives uh, to uh, the ETS companies. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, small emitters companies who are mainly customer oriented. There are a lot of... Uh, end users, consumers, and customers uh, of them who are uh, very, uh, for them, it is very challenging to, to um, change uh, uh, energy sources or plan uh, renewable energy sources, for example, a solar panel also. And uh, they are very profit-oriented. So for this reason, I 
talked about the not only for the natural uh, sustainability, uh, but the economic uh, sustainability and the social sustainability uh, field of the the goals. Uh, and yes, the ETS companies in our research are also very positive about the objectives and uh, they uh, carried out a lot of development in the past five years. So they began uh, the work uh, in this field, but um, in Hungary, there are a lot of small and medium enterprises uh, who are very customer oriented and, and, uh, and, and they, they, so we have to say, see that uh, we have to be economic uh, sustainable in this way. And I don't know exactly uh, the other uh, nation, the other states in the European Union, what is the ratio exactly the small and medium enterprises companies or the ETS companies in the economic sector. But uh, maybe in the Central Europe, it is the same uh, situation as you question. Yeah, I, the, the reason for my question was that I believe that the Commission, uh, as the executive of the European Union, would, would learn a lot from the regional differences, right? Because public policy needs to be, um, uh, you know, supported by the public, otherwise it's, it's not ex executable uh, and it's already difficult to monitor because of short staffing at the, at the Commission. But I think it would be a very important uh, information by the different regions of, of Europe, uh, the consumer, the pressure exerted for, by the consumers uh, is, is different. Now, um, Ilan, I would turn to you because uh, you mentioned that, uh, again, as, as I uh, referred to it, that public support and public policy is really important, but how do you see competitive pressure, uh, not necessarily by SMEs, Right, because they are not uh, perhaps not not your direct competitors, but by by the, the the multinational companies that you did refer to, right, at the beginning of your presentation. So, Enfao, you know, Shell, your competitors, your global competitors. How do you see competitive pressure uh, coming from them uh, from the, from the point of view environmental? mindedness and and green washing. I would like to avoid this term, but. Uh, just to pinpoint what, what I'm asking. Thank you for your uh, question. So uh, first of all, I would tell a few words about the consumers and consumers' behavior. I think it's very much different sector by sector because with an oil company, we can also see, especially in the field of chemicals, that we have consumers who demand uh, from us uh, products which contain renewable share, or uh, recycled uh, materials, so there, without any supportive regulation. So we can see such changes, but this is a completely different market of chemicals and, uh, and polymers. Uh, in the fuel sector, uh, we are very much regulated. And uh, of course, uh, our obligations, like for fuels, we have three kinds of obligation at this moment. Uh, here, all the companies are competing with each other uh, on how to uh, comply with the, with the obligations on the lowest cost. And, and for, for, for that one, there is a really fair competition that uh, who will develop the, the lowest cost renewable fuel, which we have to sell already for many years, or who can reduce the greenhouse gas emission. Uh, we are part of the emission trading system, which is uh, distributing uh, free uh, quotas free emissions based on benchmarks. So for many years, we have a target to be amongst uh, those who are very close to the benchmark. So it's also making us compete on the basis of benchmark and we can measure our uh, performance based on uh, these uh, benchmarks. So uh, the competition of course is to make uh, ourselves as efficient as possible and to comply with our targets on the best way to develop some products uh, which are, uh, which are uh, less greenhouse gas intensive because then we can comply on a lower cost. And we, I can also give you another example that uh, we have a consumer uh, who are running uh, uh, trucks and heavy trucks and they also demand us to 
uh, sell them a product uh, which uh, which is uh, more uh, how to say uh, energy intensive and they can uh, consume less based on this product so we have some kind of consumer demand as well which is changing but on the other hand uh, we are competing with others uh, on the global basis uh, how we can comply with our uh, with our obligations and also uh, to reduce our costs uh, regarding the uh, emission trading system and also uh, other uh, obligations. So, so if I understand correctly, it's, it's basically the good old benchmark and price competition with your competitors, right? Essentially. Yeah, it's very uh, much, uh, yes, it, it is on one hand, yes. And on the other hand, we also have specific benchmarks which are measuring uh, efficiency and uh, and uh, and carbon intensity. Okay, okay, thank you, Luna. Uh, Anna, the next question is to you. Very briefly, I've uh, I've seen your reactions uh, to uh, Ilona's presentation when uh, when she was saying that it's very costly for companies and we need money, money, money. We need the financing in order for the 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 right transition. So, what's your What's your take on that? Because uh, I know that the commission is, is very keen on coming up with a plethora of initiatives that are infinite. Uh, and, and then the control of that is, uh, is to be seen. So what, what do you think uh, about this uh, remark? If you could directly respond uh, to that. Of course, unmuting yourself. Yes. Yes. Am I there? OK. So yeah. the need for money indeed, uh, but I also had another uh, kind of reaction that you may you have also noted, uh, which is like uh, what what do the companies want companies want and need, and these questions what what do they want what do they need who where does the pressure comes from who moves first uh, companies consumers we are talking about different actors in the scene the regulatory framework basically we know and i think uh, many people are aware and you see that the surveys that you know climate change is a tremendously important issue and uh, now we have the uh, report of the working uh, group one of the ipcc on the uh, are, are we still uh, we have never been on track for the 1.5 percent but 1.5 degrees but you know are is it still within is it attainable sort of everyone is aware that uh, by the mid of the century uh, important transitions have to happen now how are we getting on how are we getting on the path to that? Um, this reminds me at uh, this saying that uh, has been a kind of a proverb in the context of fiscal governance at the time when it was about, you know, uh, fiscal discipline, debt reductions and so on. Uh, it was very fashionable in policy discussions to quote uh, St. Augustine, who was saying like, please, Lord, give me chastity, but not now. I'm also reminded at this uh, saying uh, in the context of the energy transition, please give us decarbonization, but not now. So where do we come to make the first step to get there? Um, first step, actually, first step has been taken, sort of. Uh, on companies, on consumers, my question actually to Vente would be, uh, to, to Lasso would be, um, do I get it right? Do I have a right impression uh, deducted from your research that uh, companies in Hungary seem to be a little bit reactive? So basically reacting or if they sense some pressure and wouldn't be kind of more desirable uh, also in the best interest of the companies to be a little bit proactive in this field that obviously builds up around us. And in this context, I have been very much impressed of the presentation of Inuna noticing that apparently Moel positioned itself on this track already in 2016. And let's be fair, in 2016, of course, uh, energy union and so on, a lot has been happening also. But, but overall, we saw that in the carbon price, for example, was far from where we are now. So this has been, I would say, a very kind of proactive attitude, of course, as we heard and as we know, this is a large company and important there. So how could we have a little bit of a situation where also on a broader scene, the companies are acting more proactively? Having said this, I also wanted to, uh, I don't know, alert us, perhaps, if, if you don't know this, uh, there had been a um, Eurobarometer research in spring this year uh, on Europeans' attitudes uh, on climate change. And uh, interestingly, the size of the survey in Hungary is very close to the size of your survey for companies. It said they have been uh, uh, um, involving uh, 1,046 people. Uh, in, in the questionnaire with all sorts of questions. And uh, I had, had taken a look yesterday still on these results. Really a high percentage of Hungarians surveyed 
perceives climate, uh, climate change as a very serious challenge, slightly above the EU average. But the general thinking is, is that uh, a higher percentage than EU average thinks that it's actually businesses and companies that need to act. I find this quite interesting, and perhaps uh, you can you you would also wish to look in more detail into this study and find perhaps also some some linkages to yours and some inspirations for conclusions. Just to make this point. That that's an interesting question, and I will give the word back to uh, Laszlo. Uh, being mindful that we are getting close to the close of the event, and we have two other questions to ask. Uh, let me just point out one thing that the whole climate change and companies attitude is very similar, in my opinion, to the, 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 the privacy paradox when everybody cares about their privacy, but when they need to act, uh, it's a very different, uh, different, uh, you know, action that comes in place. So there, there's a huge difference between attitude and behavior. And one of the questions that I noted to myself was concerning this, but uh, so last will be uh, just remember of, of what Anna asked. And I'd like to ask Chaba uh, uh, a question because everybody had the chance to uh, uh, respond to a question. And, and um, given your experience and your uh, involvement in various UN related uh, uh, initiatives and work, so how do you see that uh, what do you see the UN's uh, place uh, when it comes to climate uh, policies? How, does, how can the UN help what's going on in different regions? Because mostly one of the, 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 the first things that companies say about uh, climate policies, that it's a patchwork globally. In particular, we are talking about global companies. I'm, I probably don't, uh, you know, I don't know what MOL does, but MOL is present in, in, in 30 countries. I'm sure in different regions, they have different requirements when it comes to climate policy. So Chaba, in briefly, how do you see uh, the UN's role in it, if you see any role for the UN? Uh, well, Paul, it will take us a little bit further away from the original uh, theme of discussion, but traditionally <clears throat> we regarded factors to our threats or risk factors to our life, stability and safety, mostly linked to geopolitical rifts and divides. Even 10, 15 years ago, it was pretty much dominated our security perceptions. Now in the couple of years, in the couple, uh, say five to 10 years, uh, we noticed that the risk factors coming from the geopolitical device still stay with us and most probably will stay with us in some cases may even widen. But more and more risk factors deriving from the unsustainable way of our life, including uh, the way how we treated climate, started influencing our safety and security. And in many cases are influencing our daily possibilities more than the traditional uh, threat factors. So what the UN can do about it, beyond the traditional rules of, of, uh, of, uh, of UNFCCC, the, the climate negotiations, uh, setting targets, to let us all understand that these two types of factors are not separate anymore. They are integrated. They, in, uh, they, they are increasing jointly and they reinforce each other but we still don't have the proper system how to factor them in and how to treat them in in a systemic way so if the un can do something uh, it will be the most important part and i'm sure the european union sooner sooner or later will come to that point as well Chavo, thank you very much i i very much agree with you um uh, laszlo has answered one of the questions uh, asked by a, a participant uh, there we we have another question, um, you know, publicly available to everyone, uh, which I would like to ask before concluding. Um, it comes from Václav uh, Kural, uh, I would say Czech Republic. Uh, if not, uh, I apologize, but the name points me into that direction. Um, feel free to answer whoever is in a position. Do the companies plan to buy offsets carbon credit to achieve the net zero goal till 2030? I would believe that's more to Ilona. That question concerning companies, are they aware of the carbon dioxide removal and how the EU would like to support the CDR? 
Now, obviously, these are questions that can be answered for hours, including also the previous one, which uh, requires a great discussion on the UN's role and, and the EU's position as being a, a regulatory exporter, uh, also on, on, on environmental rules and climate change. So Ilana, would you, would you mind uh, answering that question from coming from Václav? Uh, thank you for the question, and uh, removals are very much in our focus, uh, and uh, we think that uh, removals, it's a very uh, important way of uh, CO2 emission reduction for the future, and we also check the, the possibilities how we can use removals, uh, not just uh, for greenwashing, as uh, Paul mentioned earlier, but for, uh, for other purposes as well. But as we can see now in the Fit for 55 package, removals will be much more uh, attached to the land use sectors, meaning that agriculture and, uh, and fields, and we can't really see opportunities how we could uh, reduce our emissions uh, through uh, these removals in the emission trading system or in the transport, uh, 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 transport ETS. So maybe I would pass also the word to Anna if she uh, she could uh, respond that uh, whether there is a possibility in the future that somehow these removals uh, will be made attractive for companies acting in other sector than agriculture. Thank you. So can I kind of comment on that. Uh, thank you. Indeed, this is this is also part an important piece of the overall package indeed, not this package for the Fit for 55, but uh, it's an important uh, part of our pathway to the net zero 2050 objective. Uh, the uh, kind of overall assessment and the overall kind of direction elaborated by the Commission is that, of course, also technology based removals have to play a role, carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilization as we get closer to 2050. Now, as we are aware, these technologies are not yet there to be rolled out at large scale. Uh, there are barriers uh, also um, very much is in the development phase. In that context, I have, a, uh, um, I have already uh, referred to the innovation fund that is supporting also such technologies for further development. But on carbon removals, uh, now we have to fit for 55. And in the forthcoming phase, in the forthcoming months, the commission is working actively now uh, on different aspects of uh, carbon removals, actually. Uh, at the end of the year, there will be a presentation of the approach on um, carbon removal certification, the objective being to have the same standards acknowledged across member states and having a uniform framework for certified uh, removals. So this is, for example, also one step when it comes to uh, technology-based approaches. And uh, other, uh, other lines, for example, is to address uh, barriers uh, to the rollout of such technologies. Uh, this could be economic barriers on the one hand, but also, uh, for example, related to social ex acceptance. So these are all angles on which commission policies are being prepared to address these, these issues. Uh, this will be part of, uh, of, of, of the um, policies to be taken for 2050. But also at this stage, of course, removals are relatively costly. Nature-based removals, um, in contrast, are relatively cheap. So we also have to bear that in mind. So uh, we believe that removals will be uh, there relevant where uh, the abatement cost uh, is really relatively high. There it will make sense to apply these removals also further down the, uh, the, the road. Uh, yeah, so perhaps this is a little bit from the commission angle. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we have exceeded our planned time. We are at 11.37. We plan to close the event seven minutes earlier. Um, so very brief conclusion. Uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, we have still a lot to discuss and a lot to talk about. Um, we, we can agree that energy transition, carbon neutrality, uh, carbon intensity are still the buzzwords. I have uh, missed the word of uh, uh, behavioral change, both at, uh, at company and at consumer level, which I personally believe that is going to be the key for not only for successful public policy, but also for successfully achieving the objectives of uh, public policy. Um, 
And that uh, is perhaps something that we would like to see at uh, company, consumer, EU uh, level, and, and perhaps uh, governmental level, which supports uh, the work of uh, the United Nations uh, later on. Um, if you have questions, perhaps I should close with that. Do send them along to Benz's email address. Benza, please nod. Yes. We try to attribute it to the persons who are best, uh, the panelists who are best uh, addressed uh, with those questions, and we will publish them on the Sazadvig's website. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, the, their participation, their contribution. It's been extremely interesting. It could have gone on for another hour at least. I personally would have enjoyed it. Um, and uh, again, if you have any questions, do target it to Bense. Um, so it's really important to continue the discussion between companies and the European Commission, between international organizations, research institutions. Uh, data-based science is, uh, is going to triumph, I'm uh, convinced of that, so, so let's try to learn the most from the market, from most from the consumers and the most from the actors on both sides. So thank you very much, I wish you a nice rest of the day.